Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Doug Vaughn from the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, and it's my pleasure to introduce my uh, colleague and collaborator, Antonis Hetsopoulos, who will be delivering our lecture this afternoon. Antonis uh, was born in uh, Thessalonica, which is in uh, north, uh, north central Greece. I, I tease him. I say, well, that's, that's the Turkish part of Greece, right? Yeah? And that we're at <laughs> I think that's where Ataturk was from. Is this true? Yeah. He doesn't like me saying that. Anyway, uh, he, he went to college. He went to university in Thessalonica as well, then came to the United States uh, to do his uh, PhD at Northwestern. After completing that work, he, uh, he did two postdoctoral fellowships, one at the Max Planck Institute in uh, Germany, and then he came back to the United States to do a postdoc at uh, MIT in Bob Rosenberg's lab. And that really was, I think, the catalytic experience in his life that, that transformed and defined his work, his work that continues today. While he was in Ro Rosenberg's lab, they made the discovery of um, progenitor cells from the endothelium and really defined the presence of those cells. And that, that novel observation really drove his work in terms of defining cells that contribute to uh, vascular repair and regrowth. He's continued that work uh, for the last several years, first in Munich as a group leader with the EMBO in terms of cardiovascular development and vascular gene expression. We were fortunate to recruit him back uh, or to Vanderbilt to, in late 2005. And his arrival here on our campus really catalyzed our own activity and our opportunity to get in the, into the field of cardiac regeneration. It's one of the most exciting, interesting, and potentially important therapeutic areas in the cardiovascular world today. With Antonis's guidance and his collaboration, we've put together a group here for cardiac regenerative therapy. And uh, he's going to give us his perspectives on, on that topic today, Antonis. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Doug, for these uh, kind words, and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to uh, come here and uh, tell you a little bit about our, our work over the last uh, few years. And um, so uh, it's a great pleasure, and it's also a great honor, and I'm, um, as I said, very humbled about this uh, uh, invitation, especially considering who was here before me and also looking who is coming after me. This is a great, uh, a great uh, series of, uh, of lectures. So uh, let me start by one of my uh, favorite pictures from that one of my ancestors uh, painted on a Greek vase <laughs> about uh, 2,500 uh, years ago. And it shows uh, two uh, brothers, uh, the Titans, not our own Titans, but the original <laughs> ones. And this is Atlas that is holding up the earth. And that was his punishment for going against the Zeus. And in those days, the earth was flat. And the other is his brother Prometheus, that for his punishment, he had this uh, golden eagle uh, come and eat his uh, heart every day, which was regenerating during the night. I know that most of you know the myth that is the liver, but actually the original story is about the heart. So, um, and, um, and I like this picture because in this very small vase area, the, uh, the artist uh, kind of put together some of our major concerns. One is what is the structure of our environment and universe and the outside world. And the other is about what governs the workings of our, uh, of our body. So um, I think you all know that as we, time goes by, uh, we start losing some cells and we start aging and starts this uh, process that we lose some of our powers and functions. And as I said, some of, our, of it is part of the aging. Some of it can be part of a toxic agent or a chemotherapy. There's also a large number of degenerative diseases that lead to a loss of tissue and part of our uh, organ function. Or it can be a very acute uh, event, a physical injury or an ischemic injury, like a stroke or a, or, or a heart attack. And usually what that does is, as I said, it takes away some of our cells and that may have uh, you know, serious consequences for our health as well as our cognitive abilities, mobility, and so on. So when we talk about regenerative medicine, it's try to restore some of this lost tissue. And the idea here is either to try to save lives, because if the loss is really dramatic, it can be life-threatening, or in most cases, is to improve the quality of life for the person, to try to make it more mobile or more uh, interactive with the environment. 
So when we talk about different organs and uh, regeneration, uh, there are different uh, challenges that uh, we have. I just uh, picked up this uh, early, uh, very recent slide from a review that shows the regenerative charts in the higher uh, vertebrates uh, of the different organs. And as you can see, there are some of them, the ones here on the left, that they have a very high regenerative uh, uh, capacity. And that is the blood, our skin, uh, the gut epithelium, and so on. There are some kind of in the middle that can regenerate and regrow, not as efficient, not as fast, but they can. And the biggest challenge is the organs here on the very uh, right, which they have lost most of their regenerative capacities. And that is quite a few of important organs like the brain and the heart uh, in this area. Now, uh, how the organs uh, regenerate? And of course, there are many different strategies. And I think one of the key things that has to do with uh, organ regeneration is the uh, the presence of stem cells. I mean, many of uh, the organs will have a resident stem cell population that remains there in the adult. And that is a good ex example is the blood. Another good example uh, is the, the skin. And those uh, cells continually replenish whatever cells are lost during the wear and tear uh, uh, and during, uh, you know, aging. And then there is another strategy that some other organs have. And one good example here is the liver when there doesn't seem to be an active stem cell population present, but the adult cells, the mature cells, still have the ability to divide and regrow. And that's um, what happens if you know, a piece of the liver is, is, is cut off. And sometimes we have a combination of the two. I mean, again, the liver or the blood vessels is a good example. Whenever there is an injury, the resident cells, the mature cells, will induce to grow, but also there will be uh, a population of stem cells that will come along and help this uh, regrowth uh, process. Now, when it comes to uh, cardiac regeneration, I mean, one of the um, challenges we have is that it looks like the heart has none of these mechanisms as a very effective way to repair itself. For example, the adult cardiomyocytes, they will respond to uh, uh, growth signals after an injury by hypertrophy and not by dividing and making new cells. And it looks like there are not too many few stem cells in the heart. Uh, actually, the belief just a couple of years ago was that there are no stem cells in the heart. But recently, there were some studies that show that there are some small pockets of cycling hand uh, cells inside the cardiac muscle that can have the properties of the cardiomyocyte a progenitor cell or a cardiac stem cell. And there's a great harm to find these uh, cells because they seem to be very few and difficult to isolate but they hold great promise to find a way to repair or regenerate the cardiac uh, muscle. But the fact that uh, those mechanisms are not very efficient in the heart, uh, but there is a great problem with heart regeneration because after a heart attack or during heart failure, I mean, there's a large <coughs> uh, percentage of the population that suffer from this kind of disease. Over the last few years, the scientists turned to different sources of stem cells and see if they would be able to repair and regenerate some of the damaged heart tissue. And I just put a slide here from a, a review uh, recently of the types of other uh, cell sources that have been used and tried in the heart. And basically, we are stem cells from the bone marrow, the hemopoietic stem cells or the mesenchymal stem cells that uh, were used for these uh, um, uh, repair processes. Uh, people have used uh, skeletal muscle stem cells. The muscle has a small population or it has a population of stem cells, the satellite cells, that are able to replenish lost mus uh, muscle tissue. And some of these stem cells were also considered and used uh, for uh, repair. The senchymal stem cells also from the antibody uh, tissue. And of course, uh, uh, embryonic stem cells in animal models have been used for this uh, process. Now, the literature is uh, very extensive. There's a lot of studies done with all of uh, these uh, cell types. And I just kind of summarized a little bit here in this slide what are the major findings of these uh, works. And one common property that seems is that when you throw these stem cells in, even sometimes in the circulation, they have a tendency to home to these ischemic sites, the sites of, uh, of injury. When they do so, uh, usually one of the effects is that there's an increased capillary density. The perfusion of the tissue is greatly improved. There's a reduction of cell death and inflammation in this area. 
There's also many reports of different uh, stem cell sites as uh, types differentiating to cardiomyocytes. Some of these can be transdifferentiation or a very efficient normal process of differentiation, like shown here, using uh, mouse embryonic stem cells, which they have the ability to become cardiomyocytes in vitro and in vivo. And this kind of repair, the reduction in inflammation, the better perfusion, usually due, uh, leads to a reduced infarct site. And that, of course, leads to a better cardiac uh, output after this uh, injury. Now, um, one stem population from all the ones that have been tried that um, was very, um, uh, got a lot of atten attention is actually the bone marrow uh, stem cells. And that is for various reasons. First of all, it's an easy source of stem cells, and it's replenishing itself very efficiently. The second reason is that we have, you know, a long experience with handling uh, these bone marrow stem cells for transplantation and other kinds of uh, uh, therapy. And then the other thing that kind of boosted the interest on uh, hemopoietic stem cells or bone marrow stem cells was a recent of reports back in the late eight, uh, 90s and beginning of this uh, decade that showed that these hemopoietic stem cells in vitro, but also sometimes in vivo, could start differentiating to other cell types like endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, even cardiomyocytes, skeletal muscle, neurons, and so on. Although the differentiation, let's say, to endothelial cells and smooth muscle is well established, this differentiation to neurons and hepatocytes and cardiomyocytes is still under debate. But uh, this, um, this kind of a possibility of using bone marrow uh, as a source to start repairing the heart, and also, um, uh, as I said, the early, the easy availability of these cells. And while these kind of uh, studies were still in progress in animal models, uh, clinical teams started using this concept and went to the clinic to try the efficacy of this therapy uh, during, um, you know, in uh, cardiovascular disease. And I have put here some, uh, a little summary, because there's a large number of trials, most of them small scale, that were done in many different countries, uh, mostly outside the United States, or I should say most of the, all of them outside the United States. And this kind of summary gives uh, a little bit of an uh, overview of what these kind of trials or studies uh, try to accomplish. First of all, most of them were done using these bone marrow stem cells. This is uh, either uh, isolating a small fraction of bone marrow and either using it as a whole after, you know, s some purification or by isolating more specific stem cell populations like the CD34 positive or the CD133 positive uh, cells. Some other studies use the strategy to mobilize these cells using uh, different chemokines like the GCSF. A smaller number of studies were done using skeletal myoblast uh, or skeletal stem cells as a source of cells for uh, transplantation. And more recently, another cell population that comes into play are the mesenchymal stem cells from uh, the bone marrow uh, stroma. Usually the doses uh, used were relatively uh, uh, small, 10 to 100 uh, million uh, uh, cells. And they were uh, delivered in two different ways uh, to the heart. One was through a catheter, uh, through a coronary uh, artery, and those were studies mostly addressing the uh, acute MI uh, patients. And then there was a smaller number of studies that used direct injection of these bone marrow stem cells in the peri-infract uh, area using different techniques to identify viable myocardium around the dead tissue and try to deliver the cells as close to the injury site as possible. The timing that this therapy uh, took place when it was coming to the case of the myocardial infarction was usually a few days after the event, let's say five to eight days is most of the studies, or there was used some of these uh, direct injections were done with people that had end-stage uh, heart failure. The profile is uh, usually males are 50 to 60 years old. And um, in this kind of next slide, there's a summary about what kind of results were achieved with this uh, uh, battery of uh, clinical trials. And one thing that has to uh, be said, and that's what's coming mostly uh, for most of these uh, studies, is that there's a very good safety record. In other words, with these kind of treatments, there were not many adverse effects like a myocardial infarction, a stroke, or death, or uh, 
with other events. There was a little concern about uh, arrhythmias. There is a slightly higher chance of people developing arrhythmias, the ones that got cells versus the control uh, population that gets uh, placebo or medium. And um, besides that, there was not a major, uh, as I said, uh, safety concerns with these uh, uh, therapies. And so that kind of phase uh, one studies then gave rise to um, um, uh, bigger studies later on. So besides this ventricular arrhythmia, as uh, I said, that is a, a little bit of a concern, but so far has been handled uh, with uh, uh, drug therapy. Another concern, which we don't know about, is, since all this is very recent, is about the long term of these uh, cells, how long they will stay there and what kind of effects it will have in the tissue, maybe a few years down the road. There were some calcifications that I reported in some animal models. There can be an appropriate differentiation, and that's a concern because you don't want to have bone or muscle growing into your uh, heart. There was also, um, uh, there's also some concern every time you use the stem cells that there might be some remote homing and maybe some dormant tumors that could be activated during this uh, process. And there was, uh, there's still some concern about the, um, that these cells might stimulate inflammation, uh, inflammatory response in the vascular wall and lead to atherosclerosis. But all this is still a theoretical possibility. There haven't been any reports of that except perhaps this uh, atherosclerosis and the ventricular arrhythmias uh, in some uh, patients. So um, what were the results of these uh, studies regarding the cardiac output? And this uh, put, again, a summary of what different studies have reported during these uh, 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 trials. Most of them, or many of them, they found that the left ventricular rejection fraction increased during uh, this uh, process. And the S systolic volume was uh, decreased, which is two parameters that can define the function of the heart muscle. There were also reports that the infarct size was uh, uh, decreased during uh, this process. There was thickening of the ventricular uh, wall. In many cases, there was uh, observed that the perfusion of the tissue was much better. The exercise capacity in many of these uh, patients improved with this uh, therapy. And there were also a couple of studies that didn't see much of a change uh, during this uh, therapy. So as I said in the beginning, most of these were small-scale studies dealing with safety with 10, 15 people. But the good safety record and the fact that the, there was some modern improvement led to uh, large-scale uh, studies that have been just completed uh, this uh, last year. And those were using a large number of populations, using multicenter trials, randomized uh, uh, studies that were also uh, uh, double-blind and placebo control. And here are the uh, put some results, and it's a little complicated slide, but I will just go through it a little bit uh, quickly. One of them is one trial, the first randomized trial. They used 30 uh, uh, treated patients and uh, 30 placebo. It found six months after the uh, 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 therapy that there was this modest increase in the uh, uh, left ventricular injection factor. For the control, it was 0.7 points versus 6.7 points for the uh, bone marrow treated cells. And again, this is a moderate effect, but it was uh, uh, well documented in this uh, uh, control study. Now, what was uh, also um, uh, interesting from this study is when they looked 18 months later, actually the control population started catching up with the bone marrow cell treated population, indicating that what probably happened here is the administration of the bone marrow stem cells accelerated the repair process, but uh, control or untreated uh, uh, patients are later catching up with this uh, repair process. Perhaps the most um, advertised uh, study is the repair uh, AMI study that was completed recently in Frankfurt from the group of uh, uh, Andreas uh, uh, Zeicher, and they have used a large number of uh, um, uh, uh, people in this uh, study, and uh, it was again multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. And what they saw that after four months there was this very uh, small or but uh, statistically significant increase in the left ventricular injection fraction compared to uh, to control. But that was a very moderate effect at the best of circumstances. But things start looking a little bit better when they looked. Um, in 
people that had the lowest ejection fraction, in other words, the worst case uh, scenarios in their study. And there, the difference between the control was uh, much more significant, 2.5 versus 7.5%. Uh, and this difference was not there when they looked at patients that had higher uh, uh, injection, fra uh, injection fractions to uh, begin with. And then, more uh, recently, was also another a study that was done in Leuven in Belgium that was uh, published that didn't find much of a change in the left ventricular injection fraction, but they could see a reduction of infant size and improved uh, regional fraction uh, during this uh, process. And I just put here one study that was done with uh, heart failure uh, people, and it was uh, uh, initiated in Houston, but most of the uh, treatments were done actually in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And in this case, the, the population, of course, had a much lower injection fraction being heart failure uh, patients. And there, there was a significant increase in the injection fraction that they uh, documented. So, um, as I said, these are double controlled studies, but still the effects are very moderate, and it's uh, quite a lot of questions out there if these kind of therapies are really meaning something. It is a group that says that perhaps these kind of changes are more important, and this is the kind of uh, um, population of uh, patients that uh, we should focus. But the NIH um, had the, um, uh, because many of these studies, as I said, were never done uh, here, decided to uh, set up a network of clinical centers in the United States that they will start looking into these cell therapies for uh, cardiovascular disease in a more systematic way. So they had an RFA uh, that was went into effect uh, uh, in the summer of uh, last year and called for applications for this uh, process. And uh, <clears throat> together with uh, Doug Vaughan and uh, uh, a lot of other colleagues in the cardiovascular division and in other uh, uh, departments here at Vanderbilt, we set up an application and we were successful with this application. And these are the five centers that are now being selected in, the, um, uh, in this uh, uh, network, uh, Vanderbilt, Cleveland Clinic, University of Florida, Minnesota, and the Texas uh, Heart Institute. And the idea here is to uh, try to develop in a, in a methodical, systematic way and safe way uh, trials that will test the efficacy of different types of bone marrow for, uh, for therapy. And I would just like to acknowledge the members of uh, the team here at Vanderbilt that they are part of this uh, program. Uh, and uh, I have to say it was a great fun uh, to work with uh, all these people and having all this discussion. And we set up this regenerative medicine for the heart group about a year and a half ago and start meeting every two weeks. And that led to a lot of uh, nice intellectual discussions that also was reflected in, uh, uh, in our successful application, I think. And what this uh, network uh, will do, and which just started operating about uh, um, uh, a month ago, is to uh, uh, develop first two clinical protocols, and I just put a summary of those protocols here. One will be a study that will be based on uh, uh, a catheter delivery of bone marrow stem cells to treat acute myocardial infarction. And the interest here at Vanderbilt is to uh, incorporate into this study uh, our own interest in this dose escalation of bone marrow cells to see what it would be the optimal dose of cells uh, to treat acute MI uh, people. And the other is uh, some work that goes on in, uh, 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 in the labs as well to find ways to increase the homing of bone marrow cells to the ischemic site. And the second kind of uh, clinical trial that uh, is being uh, uh, put in place is to do intramyocardial injection of bone marrow stem cells in patients that suffer from congestive uh, uh, heart failure. So, uh, and uh, again, the interest here at uh, Vanderbilt is as we have uh, some cooperation that started with a biotech company called Astrom, is to use tissue repair stem cells, which is stem cells which come from the bone marrow that have been uh, used in a process of enrichment, and see if those kind of cells, the TRCs as they're called, will have a much better effect for uh, heart repair than unfractionated uh, bone marrow cells. So uh, this is what is uh, happening at the moment at, uh, at the, uh, let's say, the clinical study field. I mean, our major um, emphasis, and that's what had been also our work, as uh, um, was mentioned earlier, is to find out how these two stem cells work when you do uh, uh, cell therapy. And um, 
Our interest started uh, many years ago in Boston when I was uh, a postdoctoral with uh, Bob Rosenberg, as uh, Doug Vaughan mentioned uh, earlier. And during that time, I got interested in trying to identify and isolate endothelial vascular progenitor cells uh, and study them as a way to understand how the vascular system uh, develops and forms. And our work was fa facilitated by the availability of a mouse line at that time, this thromomodulin like xenopine, which has replaced the thromomodulin gene, which is an endothelial-specific gene with beta-galactosidase. And what happens in this case, as you see here, all the vascular system, and just the vascular system, is stained blue with this beta-galactosidase. And this is a mouse embryo at day 9.5, and this is a day earlier. Now, the interesting thing about this uh, line is that this thromomodulin gene turned out to be a very early specific marker for these vascular stem cells as they begin to form inside the mouse embryo very early during development. And you can see here, this is the time before the vascular system forms. This is the time that these endothelial progenitor cells begin to assemble to form the first two primitive endocardial tubes, and this was a very strong marker for these cells. So using that as a guide, we developed a protocol to take these cells and isolate them and put them in culture, and then later on to grow them and characterize them in more detail. Now, one first question we had uh, in mind is, do these cells retain their ability to start building blood vessels if you go back in vivo? And we had a collaboration with uh, Dr. Falkman back in Boston. So we used some of his uh, very elaborate techniques with uh, chicken embryos and injected these mouse progenitor cells during the development of the chicken embryo. And as you can see here, this is a staining for the blood vessels in the heart of a chicken embryo. And this is a staining for the mouse progenitor cells. They have incorporated and they have formed nicely uh, a part of this uh, vasculature in the heart, indicating that in vivo they have retained this ability to incorporate and become part of the vascular system. Now, when I moved to Munich uh, um, back in 1998, uh, one thing we wanted to do is, because that was becoming now a big issue about vascular endothelial progenitor cells, also from the adult, is to use this system to understand how the vascular progenitors are also behaving during disease uh, uh, situation. And um, what I would like to uh, say is to take a few minutes and tell you what we found out during these uh, studies. And, um, and although these are our conclusions which are based on our own work, I would like to come back and say that these conclusions are probably true for most of the studies using uh, stem cells uh, today. Now, one thing that was of interest, of course, is if you have a normal mouse without any disease, what happens to these cells when they start uh, going around? And what we saw here is that early on, there is an accumulation of these stem cells in the lung and also in, uh, uh, in the spleen and liver after two days, let's say, but later on, this number begins to, uh, to decline and the cells uh, go away. And here is some of these uh, transplanted cells uh, stained in, in brown. And I think this is also a general conclusion for most of the studies that use uh, uh, stem cells, bone marrow stem cells or mesenchymal stem cells. If you inject them into the systemic circulation, a lot of them will go to the lung and the spleen and the liver. And they might stay there for some time, but then later on they clear on. Now, the situation changes if there is a disease someplace, if there's an ischemic site, an inflammation, uh, or a tumor growing. And what happens in this case is the cell seems to find their way specifically to these ischemic sites. And this is an experiment we have done in the pig heart after the myocardial infarction model and injected the cells into the circulation, into the heart, so they reach this uh, site. And as you can see here, comparing the non-ischemic area to a neighboring ischemic area, there was a much higher number of cells that incorporated into this ischemic site, as shown here by following the cells with an antibody that was specific for the transplanted cells. And that was 24 hours after the injection of the cells, and it would quantitate these numbers as shown here. And then a week later, there were cells were still there. Again, not too many cells around the peri or the peri ischemic site, but quite a few of these cells inside the uh, ischemic area. And this time, most of the cells seem to be closely associated with uh, the blood vessels. And this close association with the blood vessels also led to a significant increase in the capillary density in these ischemic areas of the transplanted uh, 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 pigs as compared to the pigs that they just uh, received uh, a control medium. 
So one question we had early on was how do the cells find their way specifically to the ischemic sites? And this we had a collaboration with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Peter Weikotz in Germany, that had this uh, technique called intravital microscopy. So intravital microscopy, which I think we also have the system here at Vanderbilt, is a way to look inside blood vessels and follow the way cells interact with the vascular wall or they circulate around. And you can inject a fluorescent dye and you can follow all the um, uh, microcirculation uh, by looking under the microscope. So what we did in this uh, uh, case is to label our cells with a different fluorescence and see what happens to them when they go through uh, an ischemic area or through a tumor growing. And this is shown here, and that was our surprise. We saw, and this is a sequence of for these video pictures, that there are two cells, number one and number two. What they do is they stick to the vascular wall as they pass by, and this cell number one stayed there through the entire time of the observation. This cell number two was first sticking in this area of the wall, then it moved to this part when it stayed a few seconds, and then it moved away. So the behavior of these progenitor cells was very reminiscent of the way that, uh, let's say, uh, activated lymphocytes in, uh, interact with the vascular wall uh, during inflammation. And then we went ahead and uh, doing a couple of experiments, we, uh, we found out that actually these endothelial progenitor cells, they express this molecule called P uh, SGL1, which is the P-selectin uh, ligand, and this is one of the ligands that the uh, 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 inflammatory cells use to interact with the vascular wall and bind to it as they go through the circulation. And indeed, we hypothesize that what happens is whenever there is a specelectin active in the vascular wall, these passing cells will start rolling on this wall and then eventually stop. And then what happens later, they transmigrate through the vascular wall and get into the uh, injured tissue. And we found out that indeed this is the case, and if you use an antibody that blocks this interaction or some other chemical, you significantly decrease the number of cells that get into the uh, infect site. So um, what we also then uh, looked is uh, what happens to, uh, you know, uh, long term or after a, a certain time to some of the parameters which are important for the heart after uh, uh, injury, and that is the infect size and the cardiac output. And as I have here is a slide that uh, compares the effect of the control compared to a heart that have received uh, uh, endothelial progenitor cells through this retroinfusion, a vein that allows a lot of the cells to go uh, to the ischemic site. And as it's shown here, there was a significant and great decrease in the infant size in pigs that received these uh, cells. And this was not the case when the cells were given systemically through the circulation. Many more cells found their way there and had a greater impact when the cells were locally delivered. It also was not uh, uh, true if we used mature endothelial cells versus endothelial progenitor cells for this uh, uh, purpose. And what is shown here on the right is that this decrease in infarct side would also had uh, benefits for the performance of the heart. And that is uh, here comparing uh, a parameter that shows how well the muscle contracts and as you can see, in the control, especially when the heart rate increases and in spacing, there's a very uh, bad output. But this was significantly improved in the animals that were treated with these, um, uh, with these cells. So it looked like this transplantation had uh, a great benefit about uh, infect size, heart output, and so on. But then started coming a couple of surprises that kind of uh, gave us a different perspective about how stem cells uh, might work uh, in vivo. And the first one is when we start looking what happens to these cells long term. And we could see that uh, a number of them will incorporate into blood vessels, as we also seen uh, in the chicken embryo. But the number of these cells was relatively uh, small. It was 2 to 5 percent when we calculated uh, these numbers. So it was kind of small to really explain the great benefits we were seeing uh, with the transplantation. So another uh, uh, thing that um, uh, also was uh, kind of surprising for us is that the benefits of this stem cell transplantation were very uh, immediate. 24 hours, if one looks in and compares control uh, animals to animals treated with endothelial progenitor cells, there is already 24 hours uh, after the transplantation a decrease in the infarct size, and also 
there is a great decrease in cell death and apoptosis in these uh, areas. And inflammation also goes down when you compare it with the uh, uh, controls that were treated with simply medium. So that means that the cells, and this gave us to our model about uh, how the stem cells, when they are transplanted, influence the, our environment, is that it has, there are two aspects to uh, the stem cell therapy. One is that if the cells go to this site, one of their roles is to build new blood vessels. This seems to be a rather uh, ineffective uh, way that the stem cells do it by themselves. But there is also a second component in this case, and that is that they seem to be a great catalyst of uh, tissue repair. There is an induction of angiogenesis. There is a decrease of cell death. There is an increase of cell survival. And also inflammation goes down. So <clears throat> what that means for us is that when you look at the stem cell as a therapeutic unit, as I said, there are two components of it. One is the building block that will replace lost tissue. The second is some kind of super pill that has these abilities to make the tissue repair uh, much better and improve the local of, uh, microenvironment for uh, tissue regeneration. And I think, and this is our opinion, that most of the results we have seen so far using stem cell therapy are coming from this property of uh, stem cells, which we don't understand, but probably this is the case, because in most of these studies that were done, when one looks later and see how long the stem cells stayed there, how much of the tissue is really built from the stem cells, is usually a small percentage a small percentage that cannot explain the great benefits that we see with the stem cell therapy uh, 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 when you look at different uh, outputs. So, um, so what is now the challenge, I think, in the field is to try to find ways, when the stem cells go there, to find ways to uh, effectively differentiate and build the tissue that uh, uh, has been lost. And I think in the field now that's one of the major questions, and there are different approaches that people are, are taking. One is, as I mentioned earlier, to try to chase those cardiac stem cells and try to see if those can be grown in vitro and be used for therapy that will be more efficient to build heart tissue than, let's say, bone marrow stem cells. Another thing is to look in this transdifferentiation of bone marrow cells to cardiomyocytes and see if we can find ways, instead of leaving the cells alone, there to find a way to become cardiomyocytes if we can educate them in some way so they can differentiate to heart cells in a more efficient way. Also, there's quite a lot of research done with embryonic stem cells because they have this immense capacity to give all kinds of cell types. A lot of studies are done with uh, zebrafish because lower vertebrates, they have uh, much better regeneration capacity than we have. So one idea is to look back into these organisms to see what can we learn about their mechanism of regeneration and can we use some of this information for repair and regeneration uh, in our bodies. And of course, recently there is a great uh, development in the biotechnology uh, area, a great interest to start developing tools for these cell, cell therapies. As I said, ways to deliver the cells or matrices or other uh, uh, you know, like a cocoon that will protect the stem cells after transplantation, and uh, <clears throat> which might give us some ways to do this uh, therapy more efficient. So I would just like to take a few minutes uh, to tell you what kind of approaches we take to, uh, 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 in this uh, field. And um, I think our um, major focus is to find ways to make this differentiation of stem cells to cardiac cells a much more efficient uh, process. And in this kind of quest, we have two approaches that we have now in the lab. One is to look in the genetic program of cardiogenesis, or if you wish, the genetic programs that operate during stem cell self-renewal and then differentiation to different cell types. And for this approach, we kind of venture into the new field of systems biology, which is a way that you don't look in the individual function of a single gene, but you use high throughput techniques to look to all the genes and all proteins and see how they behave in your system at any given time. And the second thing is we have started a screen to look for procardiogenic factors that will be able to steer these stem cells more efficiently to this cardiogenic lineage. Now this program of looking at these uh, stem cells in a more systematic way 
started in Germany uh, three years ago when I joined a European cons consortium of stem cell research that uses mouse embryonic stem cell as a model. And this is coordinated by Jürgen Hesser in the University of Cologne. And it has been a very successful and interesting group of people to work with. And in this group, I have two roles. And one is to coordinate the mesoderm differentiation group, as it said, that works with differentiation of the heart and bones and other mesodermal cell types. And the other is to coordinate the global analysis of all the data that comes out of this uh, group. Now, this is a very unique and very interesting experiment, uh, um, I think, in, in the uh, stem cell field. And it's unique because it brought all the specialists together. Everybody is interested in the stem cells, and each one of them is interested in what kind of stem cells, I mean, what kind of tissues they will get, uh, liver cells or endothelial cells or cardiomyocytes and so on. We agreed to use a limited number of stem cells and coordinate so we all use the same protocols, the same uh, uh, chemicals, the same tools. So whatever we find, it can be easily compared across the different laboratories. And when you do systematic analysis, it's not normal E2 because there's a lot of biological noise in these systems. And the idea then is to use this kind of protocol, which is shown here, when you take these mouse embryonic stem cells, you put them in these little droplets that go on the top of a, a Petri dish. And if you put a certain number of cells, let's say 500, then they can, by gravity, go to the bottom of this well and start forming what is called embryoid bodies and differentiate to different cell types, as shown here, in a very well-organized uh, matter. So then all these different groups, they started collecting RNA samples and making uh, and sending them to a central unit that did this affymetrics analysis, which is a global analysis to identify all the genes that are expressed in these cells under a large number of conditions. And so far today, I think we have about 150 to 200 experimental conditions done in triplicates, each one analyzing uh, about 45,000 genes. So that created, in my estimate, a, a number of like 800 million data entry points. And we took these 800 million data entry points, and together with the bioinformatics in Berlin and in Estonia, which are very smart people, we threw all this data into the computer, and we asked a single question. Can you find genes which they always behave the same way during this battery of different conditions, this very different uh, uh, stimuli that the cells were exposed? And the idea behind this is that if such groups exist, probably the fact that they stick together in many different conditions means that they somehow are linked genetically to each other. So the computer came up with this graph, and it told us that indeed there are groups of genes that they always behave the same way. And what this graph shows is every line represents the average expression pattern of dozens of hundreds of genes. And the ones that go this way during the days of differentiation of the cells represent the genes that these are the stem cells at the time they be differentiated. So there is a group of genes that goes up immediately after the differentiation begins. And then in a very orderly function, it's followed by a second group a little bit later. Then a third group of genes on the third day, a fourth group, fifth group, and so on. At the same time as this happens, there's a group of genes that goes down immediately after this differentiation, immediately after the stem cells begin to lose their uh, totipotency or the self-neural capacity. And then again, in an orderly fashion, it's followed by different groups of genes. So our main hypothesis now is that this sequential downregulation of genes reflects the gradual, as I say, deconstruction of the stem cell self-renewal machinery. And these waves we see of genes going down probably reflects the way of genetic pathways that control the stem cell self-renewal process. And at the same time, these waves of upregulation of genes that happens again in this very orderly manner represent this gradual buildup of uh, cell diversity or the hierarchy of genetic pathways that start building up different cell types from a stem cell. And then it came one of the biggest surprises, at least in my uh, scientific career, and that is that the two 
genetic pathways are mirror images of each other. And this is if you compare the genes that go up immediately after stem cells begin to differentiate and lose their self-renewal, and you see the genes that go down, they are very, they are mirror images of each other. This is also true for the genes that come up in the second wave. Again, the up genes and the down genes, they behave the very same way. This is true also for the genes that come a little later and a little later as well. So what that means, I think, is that besides what we have learned about what every single gene is doing, there is a very central pathway that controls this differentiation of stem cells that we have no idea how it's controlled. We have no way to know now at least what are the mechanisms that control this very elaborate mirror imaging of stem cell genes that have to do with diversity of cell cells and di differentiation to the ones that have to do with the uh, self-renewal. Now in this, um, and it's, although this was studied for mouse embryonic stem cell, it is my feeling that this is true probably for every stem cell population, that there is a very elaborate program that if we understand how it's regulated, perhaps it might give us a lever to push these cells to different cell types. One, there was one uh, group of genes actually that didn't have a mirror image. And I put it here because uh, of my friend, uh, Lila Solnita uh, Kressel, that is here in the audience. And this group of genes, which shows here, and it's the only one that doesn't have a mirror image, it's actually all the genes that seem to control gastrulation during embryogenesis. Those are the genes that set up the body plan, that seem to come out out of the blue and set up now the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. And of course, there's this famous quote from uh, Louis Volpert that says that it's not birth, marriage, or death, but gastrulation, which is truly the most important time in your life. And I think this is probably the first time that we might say that probably he was right. There's something very unique about uh, gastrulation. Now, what was also interesting for me is with these genes that come now that set up the body plan, there are also two genes which are put here in yellow, which are the genes which are the early seeds of cardiogenesis. Those are some of the two early gene markers that have to do with uh, the development of the cardiac tissue. So now our plan is, or what we will try to do is to can you find out ways, factors, agents, to push these cells towards the cardiogenic lineage in a more effective way? And in order to do that, we started a screen and to use to find a source of good cardiogenic factors. And although we were trying for a long time, we just realized a few years back that the best source of this cardiogenic factor was actually now tissue culture. And those were these early endothelial progenitor cells we isolated from the embryo that I told you a little bit earlier. And the reason I'm saying that is because these early endothelial cells, the endocardium that's shown here versus the myocardium shown here, they grow together and interact with each other for heart development. It's the factors that the endocardium produces that induce myocardial differentiation and vice versa sometimes. Of course, there are other sources of signals, but this interaction we know is probably important for heart development. So we took these endothelial progenitor cells that we had in culture and went back to our favorite uh, technique, which is the asymmetric gene chips, and analyzed all the things that the cells produce, and came up with a list of about 100 proteins that these uh, uh, cells produce. And our hypothesis now is that among those 100 proteins, there's a group of them that have procardiogenic properties. So in order to do that, we started a screen that had two components. <coughs> the first component, is to use zebrafish as a screening tool to see if these proteins and if these genes have a way to influence heart development. And we use these fish that have a green fluorescent protein uh, expression in the heart. And those genes, and of course, the zebrafish heart is shown here, it's also beating nicely. So by using gain and loss of function studies, you can find out how those genes might influence the development of the heart. And then perhaps also later on its regeneration. So another screen we do in parallel is to use genetically engineered mouse embryonic stem cells, which we engineer them to express uh, a red fluorescent protein every time a stem cell turns into a cardiomyocyte. So that allows us to see by screening again during their differentiation if we can get a higher yield of cardiomyocytes. And those cardiomyocytes, 
are also fun to watch because they're also a bit in culture, and it's easy to follow them uh, as they happen. And as you also notice, the mouse cells beat more robust than the zebrafish cells because they need more power. So during this uh, process, we found a couple of uh, proteins, or I would say more than a couple of proteins, that have this ability to turn stem cells to cardiomyocytes. And one of those examples is here. And this is the control differentiation of stem cells. As they differentiate, some of them will turn cardiomyocytes, and you can see them when they turn red. But if you add this protein during the time that gastrulation ends and the early cardiogenesis begins, you can 10 or 20-fold increase the yield of cardiomyocytes. Now, what is interesting is, besides in vitro, if you use this protein and inject it into the zebrafish, and this is the normal, the wild-type zebrafish, what you see, and this is the heart, there is a, a second heart now that also develops in the posterior part of the uh, embryo. And this happens because this protein has the ability to set up the cardiogenic process in very ectopic areas, as shown here. This is where the normal heart is. This is a gene which is specific for the cardiac progenitor cells in zebrafish. You see now that when you inject this gene or protein, you start seeing expression of this in uh, different uh, areas of the embryo. So this is when uh, the invitation to give this talk caught our love, and this is what we are doing now. We're trying to put the two things together. And one thing is to use now these cardiogenic factors, go back to our differentiation and do the affirmatics analysis, and see how the different pathways I show you that go up and down, how they might change when you expose the cells to a protein that pushes them towards a certain differentiation process. And then these factors also have a, very, a more practical uh, application for us, and that is if we put these factors together with stem cells and transplant them in the heart, will that increase the yield of stem cells that they become uh, cardiomyocytes? So the kind of, as a last slide, what I put here, the future paradigm of cell therapy, we try now using those stem cells and these different cardiogenic factors we found and try to see by creating this mixture and put and go back to the heart, if we can enhance this uh, regenerative capacity of the stem cells. And I would like to just take a couple of minutes and uh, just acknowledge some of our uh, colleagues and collaborators and people in the lab. We had a very nice collaboration with the lab of Ella Knapping when it, uh, with uh, the zebrafish uh, screens. The big work in the transplantation of the stem cells after myocardial infarction were done in Munich with a group of uh, Christian uh, Kupat. And the Fungins Consortium and the Bioinformatics team is the one that we have done uh, all this uh, work with, uh, with the different genes expressed in, in uh, stem cells. And also I would like to acknowledge the funding that we have uh, received in the lab. And uh, I would like to uh, stop here and take any questions. Thank you. Yes. I mean, for the cells to go to the ischemic area, if you, if you deliver them through the blood circulation, our experience with the animal models is that you need active interaction with the vascular wall. The problem is that many of these genes that regulate this active interaction between circulating cells and the vascular wall are not active at any given point. They're activated during inflammation for a particular point. So it can be that if you wait too long after an ischemic incident, and these inflammatory conditions have gone down, and the endothelium is now dormant, you might not express the right receptors to capture those cells. So here the challenge becomes to reactivate the endothelium so you can increase the yield of the cells. When it comes to directly injecting the cells around the perinfarct area, then it is, I think, a matter of how good you can identify viable myocardium with your techniques you have to put the cells in areas which are close to the ischemic site but still in a viable myocardium, which is still getting some perfusion. 
because if they are injected inside the dead myocardium, then usually they die after the uh, injection. Yes? The, uh, the arrhythmias you see are interesting. Are those reperfusion arrhythmias? And, or, or is there something else going on? Well, I think the, uh, what people think is happening is that as you all know, the muscle is a very compact thing that depends of every cardiomyocyte talking to its neighbor in synchrony. And the idea is that if you start injecting cells between those cardiomyocytes, you might create areas that this is disrupted, and that could also lead to arrhythmias. So far, as I said, with uh, drug uh, treatment, it was not a serious problem. But I think probably the major reason is that you start disrupting this communication between cardiomyocytes. Are people having to take long-term Well, this thing is very recent. I mean, a year or two ago, so we don't have a long experience. But so far, yeah, they have used beta blockers and the usual ways to control. I think in the case of the skeletal myoblast, there were some more severe cases because those cells can kind of link to the cardiomyocytes more efficiently, but then they lack the right channels to communicate with them. So in this case, they also resorted to implanting devices to control the arrhythmias. Yes? Um, yeah, I mean, this is the second challenge, is to not only make them cardiomyocytes, but effectively link them to the resident cells. When you look, I mean, most of the other stem cells that are used, this differentiation to cardiomyocytes is really one cell here and one cell there, and they seem to be linked to the other cardiomyocytes. Embryonic stem cells seem to regenerate larger areas, and again, those seem to form proper contacts with surrounding cells. But this is one of the challenges, that you might create some cells that you might not be able to link. That could also link to arrhythmias, of course. Lila? Um, well, it's a more challenging, uh, of course, uh, um, situation to try to recover these cells, and a lot of people have thought of that. Um, the number of cells that you really inject and the number of cells you find there is really too small to analyze them with, a, let's say, a, a systematic RNA analysis. Uh, people have done that, and of course there are changes that take place in the cells, but this is something that hasn't been really addressed in a significant uh, uh, way yet. But um, it's also linked to what I said earlier, that abnormal differentiation. If the cells now start expressing things which, when you put them in, they didn't, how will that maybe affect the, uh, the tissue? Okay, thank you very much.